for this early start, uh, and the floor has developed so that we can proceed as we typically do with opening statements. And I want to thank all of my colleagues for the last few days for making uh, special arrangements, uh, being brief and concise so that we could uh, ensure we could get to the floor. Good morning. Uh, the committee meets today to receive testimony in the President's budget request for the Department of the Army for fiscal year 2025. Our witnesses today are Secretary of the Army Christine Warmoth and Chief of Staff of the Army General Randy George. I would note that this is General George's first posture hearing before the committee. Welcome, General. Thank you both for your service, and please convey this committee's appreciation of the men and women serving under your command. This is a challenging but important period for the Army. Even as the Army navigates the most difficult recruiting environment in half a century and the most dangerous global security environment since the Second World War, it is also undertaking a thorough service-wide modernization effort. It is critical that this effort is successful as the threats before the Army are significant. We know that China seeks to challenge the United States' interest in leadership in the world, that Vladimir Putin views Ukraine as a stepping stone in his imperialist vision, and that Iran seeks to exploit the war between Israel and Hamas to expel uh, the United States and other countries from the region. The United States Army, the most combat-credible ground force in the world, is fundamental to successfully deterring and, if needed, confronting these threats. It is worth knowing that each of these challenges I just mentioned can be addressed in part through the National Security Supplemental that the Senate passed more than two months ago. The bill would support Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan, provide humanitarian relief in Gaza, and replenish the United States Army with the stocks and resources it so urgently needs. And I urge the House to pass this supplemental funding immediately. And indeed, if we are, have to once again encounter it, that we do so immediately. In its fiscal year 2025 budget, the Department of Defense has requested $186 billion for the Army, continuing multiple years of flat budgets for the service. And I'm concerned that inadequate investment in the United States' primary land component may create vulnerabilities and complicate decisions about how to use the funding. We risk the Army's combat strength if we do not provide it with the resources it needs to continue full modernization. Secretary Wormuth, General George, I'm interested in hearing about the Army's view of its mission globally, especially in the Pacific, as well as how the service is adjusting its operating concepts and force posture within its budget constraints. To remain competitive with China and Russia, we must prioritize investments in the cutting edge technologies that will define future battlefields across all domains. <laughs> The Army specifically has been pursuing modernization in key areas like long-range fires, air defense, vertical lip, and deep sensing, among others. These are ambitious and far-sighted objectives. I'm also encouraged by the Army's efforts on its new cross-functional team focused on contested logistics. This team, under the director direction of Army Futures Command is addressing the need for more resilient and agile logistics in dangerous environments like the Indo-Pacific. I recently visited a number of Army posts, including Raffinavir Training Area in Germany and Fort Sill and McAllister Army Ammunition Plant in Oklahoma. I've been impressed by the work that these soldiers and Army civilians are doing to not only train and equip our warfighters, particularly for counter UAS missions, but also the lessons and knowledge gained from our foreign partners, including the tens of thousands of Ukrainians who have conducted training at Grafenwehr. I would like to know what lessons and tactics the Army is learning from the conflicts in Europe and the Middle East, and what resources are needed to implement them. As I mentioned, the Army's most valuable asset has always been its people. I am pleased to see this budget request places a priority on taking care of our soldiers by providing a 4.5% pay raise and committing more than $2 billion per year for the next several years to improve barracks and family housing. The Army is also making significant investments and improvements to its recruiting enterprise. For the past several years, the service has fallen far short of its recruiting goals, but recent program initiatives, including a major new marketing campaign and expansion of the Future Soldier Prep Course, appear to be gaining some ground. 
I would ask for an update on your efforts to recruit a broader pool of potential recruits and grow back end strength in the coming years. Finally, the Army must continue to improve its readiness in the context of long-term strategic competition. The Army's focused on increased training exercises, including Defender Europe, Pacific Pathways, and its leadership in the Project Convergence series demonstrate a commitment to broad experimentation and regional preparedness. I would ask for an update on how the Army is designing exercises to support its forces on our pacing threats, China and Russia. Again, I thank the witnesses for their participation today. Look forward to the testimonies. And as a reminder for my colleagues, there will be a closed session immediately following this hearing in room SVC 217. Uh, let me now recognize the ranking member, Senator Worker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the witnesses for being here today and for uh, briefing so many of us before this hearing. Um, the chair mentioned that this is General George's first testimony before the committee in this capacity. It's noteworthy that Secretary Warmoth actually administered the oath of office to um, the general via cell phone while he was visiting the 11th Airborne in Alaska. Since then, uh, these two leaders have worked together to reform their service branch, and I commend both of our witnesses for their shared leadership. In October, the Army announced a series of overhauls to its recruiting structure and strategy in an effort to combat the recruitment crisis. Uh, I hope to learn more about this today. When implemented, the entire Army recruiting enterprise will reside under a single three-star commander. This person will serve for four years and report directly to the Secretary of the Army. The service is now targeting prospective candidates in the college age range, embracing modern data collection methods and professionalizing the Army recruiter role. So I look forward to hearing an update from the Secretary about these reforms as well as current recruiting progress. Um, these recruiting overhauls directly impact the new total Army analysis released in February. The Army rightfully reduced force structure to align better with the number of soldiers in its formation. The service plans to stand up a new counter UAS, uh, some new counter UAS batteries, fire protection battalions, and multi-domain task forces to adjust to current trends in warfare. While I support these decisions, I remain cautious about the reductions in special operations forces, and would like to hear from General George about the service's proposed force structure changes. All of the units and soldiers in the total Army analysis will rely on current Army modernization efforts. I'm encouraged that the Army's FY25 budget request contains more than double its purchase year over year of precision strike missiles, a critical capability in the Indo-Pacific. Further, the Army tripled its request for Coyote counter drone interceptors to help protect our soldiers and overseas bases from Iranian attack drones. I also thank the witnesses for using congressionally provided multi-year procurement authority to procure both Gimlers and Patriot missiles. However, I must say it's disappointing to see additional Patriot and Stinger missiles on the unfunded requirement list rather than fully funded in the base budget. Um, unfortunately, the Biden administration has again done a disservice to the Army in the FY25 budget submission. When accounting for inflation, this year's budget is more than a 2% cut compared to last year. Um, Madam Secretary and General George, and members of the committee, I, I uh, appreciate the chairman of the committee uh, just a moment ago expressing concern that we are not providing um, adequate resources to the Army uh, to get the task done. General George submitted a list of over $2.2 billion worth of unfunded priorities the Army needs, including more counter UAS capabilities like Roadrunner and reconnaissance systems. Um, I think that's a low figure. Um, I'm convinced the Army actual unmet needs far exceed this $2.2 billion. And so, General, um, I'm going to ask you to comment on that. U.S. Army Pacific has $430 million of unmet needs, of which only $100 million are covered in the unfunded list. 
Plus, we know of significant shortfalls elsewhere, such as nearly $1 billion missing to update the Army prepositioned stocks this year. The Army plays a leading logistical role in the Western Pacific. And I'd like to hear from both of our witnesses about what else we can do to improve our ability to operate there. Tell us what you need, please, and we'll try to get it for you. Congress must correct um, this budget request and ensure the Army has the resources to meet the needs um, and meet our nation's challenges. Um, thank you to my teammate, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Wicker. Uh, Madam Secretary, please. Good morning, Chairman Reed, Ranking Member Wicker, distinguished members of the, sub of the committee. Thank you, first of all, for your continued support of our soldiers, our, their families, and our Department of Army civilians. General George and I appear before you this morning at a period of profound transformation for the United States Army. We are transforming our capabilities, our force structure, and our recruiting enterprise to ensure that the Army is ready and able to defeat evolving threats, keep pace with technology, and attract the very best talent. As we pursue this transformation, we're also taking care of our people, ensuring that our soldiers and their families have the quality of life they deserve to sustain our readiness now and in the future. This is my fourth year before the committee, and like last year, the FY25 budget continues to support the most ambitious modernization effort the Army has undertaken in over 40 years. We're making significant progress transforming our capabilities by staying consistent in our goals and meeting key milestones for development and fielding. The next generation squad weapon, integrated battle command system, the mid-range capability, and the precision strike missile are examples of just some of the critical new systems we've recently delivered. As we bring new systems into our inventory, we're also transforming our force structure to meet the priorities of the national de defense strategy. We're building out new formations, like our multi-domain task forces, to make sure that they're equipped with the capabilities we need to conduct large-scale combat operations against advanced military powers. And we're shrinking excess force structures so that the units we do have are manned and ready. While these force structure decisions will bring down authorized troop levels by about 24,000 spaces, our goal is to increase the Army's authorized end strength from 445,000 to 470,000 by FY 2029. To meet that goal, we are working around the clock to overcome our recruiting challenges. Building on successful initiatives like the Future Soldier Prep Course, we are fundamentally transforming our recruiting enterprise to better compete in the 21st century job market. Most significantly, we are redesigning our recruiting workforce by creating new permanent talent acquisition specialties for both enlisted soldiers and warrant officers. And actually, the assessment and selection of the first cohort of warrant officers is complete, and the first group will be going out into the field later this summer. But while we transform, we can't afford to lose sight of our soldiers and their families and what we need to do to take care of them. A key part of that responsibility is providing safe, high-quality housing and barracks. And over the next five years, as the chairman, I think, noted, the Army is going to invest an average of $2.1 billion annually in the construction, sustainment, restoration, and modernization of barracks for our soldiers. This investment will include barrack sustainment at 100% for the first time in years. We are also going to leverage the expertise of the Army Corps of Engineers to stabilize our project costs as much as possible, and we will be hiring civilian barracks managers so that our soldiers can focus on warfighting. Physically and emotionally healthy soldiers are more resilient, higher performing, and less likely to engage in harmful behaviors. To build resilient soldiers, we are expanding our health and holistic fitness programs to 71 active component brigades. We're investing in financial counseling to make sure that our soldiers and families know how to manage their money. And we're encouraging programs in our divisions to focus on soldier well-being. Our goal has been and remains building cohesive teams that are ready to fight and win. Throughout this transformation, which we absolutely have to do because, as you all know, it's a very dangerous world out there, we're continuing to provide combatant commands with what they need, trained and ready formations. This year's budget seeks $1.5 billion for activities tied to the Pacific Deterrence Initiative 
And we've asked for $460 million for Operation Pathways, the series of exercises we conduct in the Indo-Pacific to strengthen deterrence and also build regional interoperability with our partners and allies. In Europe, our troops are demonstrating our commitment to deterring Russian aggression. The Army is leading support to Ukraine. We've trained over 17,000 Ukrainian troops, and we provided, as you all know well, hundreds of vehicles, weapon systems, and millions of munitions. In the Middle East, our soldiers are mission-focused and standing ready to provide further support for Israel's defense and to enhance broader regional stability. The Chief and I strongly urge the passing of supplemental appropriations that will maintain this critical support to Ukraine, support partners in Asia and the Middle East, and invest in our own readiness, all while, all while creating jobs for Americans all around the country. With your support, we will continue to take care of our people and sustain the transformation that will keep our Army the best in the world. I'm proud of all that our soldiers and Army civilians do and look forward to your questions this morning. I thank you very much, Madam Secretary. General George, please. Thanks, Chairman. <clears throat> Chairman Reed, Ranking Member Wicker, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity today to talk about our Army. The world is more volatile today than I have seen it in my 36-year career, and there is clearer cooperation between adversaries than we've seen in a while. A spark in any region could have global impacts. Meanwhile, the character of war is changing rapidly, which we see from what is happening on battlefields in the Ukraine and in the Middle East. Our army is as important to the joint force as it has ever been. We must deter war everywhere and be ready to respond anywhere. So we are focused on providing the best army with the budget we are given. Our soldiers deserve it, the joint team deserves it, and our nation deserves it. And that means making some tough decisions and finding ways to get better every day. As the Secretary already highlighted, our planned investments reflected in our FY25 budget will help our Army win the future fight and ensure that our soldiers and their families remain ready and resilient. Across the Army, we are learning from global events and continuously transforming how we operate, how we train, and how we equip, and I'd like to highlight a handful of things. We're learning that designs for things like unmanned systems must be modular, adaptable, and software defined. We are working to get relevant technology in the hands of our soldiers immediately. We are learning that counter unmanned systems must evolve as the threat does to protect our formations and critical infrastructure. We are also moving out on that while being mindful of the cost curve. We need cheaper solutions. We are learning that in some cases, the right tech already exists to support transformation. For instance, the tech exists to make our command and control nodes more mobile, low signature, and more effective. And we are fixing our network. And we are building our magazine depth and modernizing our organic industrial base because we know that wars never end as quickly as we hope. They take a lot of ammo. We are also transforming how we recruit, ensuring that we have the right talent and right tech and that we are getting the word out about how our Army is a great place to serve because of our mission and our people. Finally, we are also looking at where we need to reimagine our processes and where we can afford to stop doing things that don't support our warfighting mission or building cohesive teams. I'm proud of what our soldiers are doing around the world. We appreciate your support, and we look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, uh, General, uh, both for uh, the Secretary and the uh, Chief of Staff. The obvious point is you're operating under a flat budget, essentially, and that makes your decisions of how you spend the money more and more critical. Uh, Secretary Wormworth, the, the obvious has made some shifts in his priorities this year. Uh, can you describe the overall guidance for building this ready and modernized army and the shifts you've made? Certainly, Chairman. Uh, you know, the Chief and I are very focused on spending every single dollar that we have in the most effective way. And I think um, the broad direction of our modernization program has remained the same. You know, we continue, as you said in your statement, to focus on investing in air and missile defense, in long-range precision fires, 
in uh, advanced aviation and a number of other categories. You know, I, I think we did make obviously a significant decision in choosing to not pursue further the FARA reconnaissance aircraft. But in doing that, uh, we, we basically came to the realization looking at, you know, what's happening on the battlefield in Ukraine, for example, what's happening with technology. We felt we could meet that requirement with, in a different way. Uh, and we also wanted to make sure we kept our aviation industrial base healthy. And so that led us to the, the multi-year um, procurement of additional but more modernized Blackhawks. But beyond that, I would say, you know, again, the, the, the broader goals of our modernization program are looking at the uh, large-scale combat operations study that we did several years ago now. I think the things that that led us to invest in, frankly, have been validated to a large degree by what we see happening on the battlefield in Ukraine in particular. Uh, and so we're going to continue, I think, with all of those important portfolios. And they're, they're going to give us capabilities that we need to be able to deal with challenges in the Indo-Pacific, but also in Europe and elsewhere, because as the chief says, you know, we're a globally deployable army. We're not focused on one theater. Thank you, Madam Secretary. General George, uh, again, in the context of uh, this budget, in the context of the strategy that the Secretary has laid out, uh, how are you maintaining ready combat formations, which is essential to the mission? Yeah, Chairman, and that's uh, every month I chair the readiness update. Um, and there's nothing more important than having a, a having a ready army, and so we're completely um, focused on that. To carry on a little bit with what the Secretary was talking about, what we're, I mean, we owe it to get every, make sure that every dollar that we're spending, and so we're looking at processes. I give you a couple examples of, um, and I mentioned up front in my opening remarks about how we got to get after cheaper solutions. And I think unmanned systems is a is a good um, example of that. Countering unmanned systems as well. We can't keep you know we can't afford to keep lobbing very expensive missiles out of that. So we're working on and those kinds of things through R and D and then getting stuff forward to do it. And then the battlefield is is changing is changing really quickly. So one of the things that I've been that we've been talking about is I think that what will help us in that is having more flexible funding. Um, that would allow us to make some of those adjustments uh, as rapidly as the battlefield is changing. Thank you. Um, the issue of recruiting always comes up. Uh, can you give us an update, Madam Secretary? I think we're making a little more progress. We are. Uh, we still have six months left to go in the fiscal year, so the chief and I don't want to be overconfident. Uh, but right now, we are on a very good pace, I think, to meet this year's recruiting goal, which is 55000 new contracts plus 5,000 in the delayed entry program. Um, so that's, you know, that's very good news. February and March were very good months. The chief and I actually just chaired yesterday a meeting with all of the senior leaders from our recruiting enterprise. You know, I think we continue to see very good success with the Future Soldier Prep Course, our um, advertising campaign. I don't know if you all saw some of the ads during the March Madness basketball tournament. We, as I said, you know, we, we've selected our first cohort of new warrant officers. Uh, we are doing some things to leverage um, better data to give our recruiters stronger leads, and we're looking at how to break into the college market. So I, I think we're doing well. We've also, I would say, we've, we're selecting our existing recruiters in a different way that's more attribute-focused, looking at sort of personalities. And we're also, we, we've uh, overhauled the curriculum in our recruiting college. About 40% of the curriculum has changed. And so the, the recruiters that we surged kind of last um, late last year are, have gone through that, and they're in the field now, and I think they're part of the reason why we're seeing our contracts per month go up. Uh, one layer you just mentioned is uh, focusing on college students. I've always felt that junior colleges are an excellent place to um, recruit. Uh, you have people who are mature, more so than, than high school, and then, uh, I hope, and then you have also people who have made a conscious decision not to go to a four-year school. Uh, um, are you finding success there? Well, uh, I would say, Chairman, we are absolutely looking at junior colleges, community colleges. You know, we're looking at kids maybe who did a couple years um, of college but then dropped out for whatever reason. I would say 
candidly, Chairman, we're still in the early days. We, what actually, Chief and I just talked about this yesterday. We really need to do some more market research on that some college, college market. Our, we just haven't been focused on that market for so long, so we really need to dig into that more, and we're actually going to engage um, a private sector company to help us with that. Thank you very much. Senator Wicker, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. General George, uh, you said, I believe, this is the most volatile international security situation in, uh, did you say, 37 years? In my 36 years. Thir 36 Senator. years, okay. And also, your, your uh, prepared statement uh, with the Secretary says the Army must transform quickly. Uh, Chairman Reed said that the budget um, that's now been proposed is essentially a flat budget. I, I think he, he might not take issue with, uh, with my statement that it's uh, a 2 percent cut when you, when you consider inflation and purchasing power. Uh, I understand what the Secretary uh, said about using every dollar carefully and making sure that, that, it's, uh, that we squeeze every, every bit of value. But we're not going to meet this threat simply by being more efficient with, uh, with the dollars that have been asked for, e either in, um, in your budget submission or the unfunded requirement. Um, there are $430 million in unmet needs in U.S. Army Pacific, and only $100 million of that $430 million uh, is covered in the Army unfunded list. Uh, we need a we need almost a billion dollars to update Army preposition stocks this year. Um, this budget is not adequate for this most volatile situation in thirty six years, is it, General George? Um, Senator, what I was focused on in the unfunded priority list first and foremost was everything that we could potentially execute. So there was two things in the unfunded priority list that um, we put in there, and it was very extensive process that we went through. One was a lot of things that were in our base budget, but um, we next on the list to maximize production. So there's some of those that took us out to production. And then the other example is uh, facts of life changes. What happened on October seventh? Okay, what well, we you know, we only we only have a, just a, a brief, brief moment. But uh, the the uh, the three hundred thirty million dollars that aren't covered of the uh, um, of U.S. Army Pacific, uh, you're going to need that, aren't you? Are you saying you can't execute that in the next fiscal year? I know what was included on there was specific to uh, to U.S. Army Pacific with some additional campaigning that but, we're doing. But, but there's a $430 million in unmet needs and only $100 million are covered in the Army unfunded list. Um, you could use that entire $430 million in this next fiscal year, could you not? Um, Senator, I'd have to go back and look. I don't know what the other you know, additional funding that you're specifically okay, well, referring let, to. Let me just say, um, I do appreciate the fact that we have to be efficient. We, we've got to get the uh, absolute value out of every single taxpayer dollar that, uh, that we entrust with you. But we're, we're going to need, um, if we're going to keep the peace and have peace through strength, which has always worked, that uh, we're going to have to, um, we're going to make sure that you tell us uh, what you need. Let me ask you this, General George. Uh, the Secretary mentioned um, the things that we're doing to help the effort of our friends in Ukraine. Um, what lessons are we learning that we, that we can use later on? Should we be asked in another theater to go into combat? Um, Senator, I could go on for a long time. I'd love to come over and talk to you about lessons. We have a big um, we're, we're formation that's over there. We'll, we'll use to a do this, and I'll give you a couple of quick. I'll give you some really quick examples. We're learning the effectiveness of ground-based long-range fires. We're learning that uh, UAS unmanned systems and countering unmanned systems is rapidly evolving. We're learning that the EW landscape is changing everywhere between three weeks and three months. 
and so that we need to be more flexible in our approach. And this is why e we're EW being electronic warfare. So the battlefield is changing really, really rapidly. We're learning about the uh, how well how well additive manufacturing is going to work and reduce our can help us reduce our footprint. We're learning that you can be seen anywhere on the battlefield. And um, you're going to have to become more mobile, lower signature. That's why we're focused on our network, because if you can be seen, you can be killed. And we're doing all of those things and training all of those things. And we're taking those lessons, and they're not lessons uh, learned until we've actually changed how we trained, change how we operate, change how we equip, and then um, change how we buy things. General, there's no way to learn that other than actually watching actual combat. Is that correct? Well, I think uh, we're watching a lot of that unfold, and we've got a lot of uh, combat experience inside and, and we're, of our we're, formation. We're doing that without any of our guys and gals having to actually be in combat. We're uh, we're doing we that are. watching someone yes. else use watching. our assets. exactly. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Worker. Senator Shaheen, please. Um, good morning. Thank you, Secretary Warmoth and General George, both for being here and for your service to the country. Um, Secretary Wormuth, I'm sure you won't, probably won't be surprised to know that I'm still focused on night vision devices. Um, this is the second year in a row in which the budget has included very little for procurement of um, night vis vision devices, and it, it makes it hard for me to understand what the Army's plans are for the future. Um, the budget for 25 suggests that the Army plans to both to buy both L3 Harris's EMV GBs and Microsoft's IVAS systems, but it doesn't really justify how it's going to sustain both. Can you give us some more detail on what you're planning? Yes, Senator Shaheen. Uh, as you know, we are planning to buy uh, both capabilities, and I think you know we don't see it as an either or. Uh, they each bring some different things to the table, and. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think there's um, more in the budget this year for the enhanced night vision goggles than last year's budget. I think we have money in there for about 2,300 uh, additional um, sets of goggles. We also have money in the budget for 3,000 of the 1.2 version uh, IVAS you know, hologram head headsets. Uh, as you know very well, because you and I have talked about this over a number of hearings, um, you know, we're continuing to work with Microsoft on that program. We have some additional testing coming up this year. We're going to be doing a lot of testing on the 1.2 version. We did, um, the, the last test that we ran looking at IVAS was much more successful. The soldier feedback we got was much better. You know, the, the form factor for the headset was more comfortable. They weren't having as much neck strain. And I think the resolution on the, um, for the vision piece was better. So, um, we are planning to continue with both programs, but of course we're going to look and see what the results are for the 1.2 version uh, later this year before we decide further on the IVAS. And according to the budget justification materials, the IVAS system um, heads-up display is designed to work within their network to provide situational awareness um, and synthetic training environment capabilities. I'm quoting, so hopefully I'm going to get that correct. Are all Army situational awareness devices um, interoperable with the IVAS network? Do we um, know that yet? It, it, well, it, what, what that means, really, and it's been a little while since I've actually worn IVAS, but the, you know, one of the things that's unique about IVAS is that it allows our soldiers to have sort of a virtual training environment so that they can plan you know, tactical missions, for example, wearing the headsets, and also to use that for training. That's not a capability that we have right now on uh, any of our other systems. So it's, that's why it's a bit of a pathfinder in wearable technology for us and one of the reasons why we're interested in it. Well, I certainly look forward to seeing more of what um, the experiment and the record shows that IVAS can do. Um, General George, in your opening comments, you talked about wanting more flexibility for um, budget. What what specifically? I know we've we've done allowed the multi-year procurement, but are there other things that you're suggesting that you need in order to better manage the funding that you have? 
Um, Senator, yeah, first, the, the multi-years for 155, uh, Gimler, PAC-3 have been extremely helpful to us. Um, on the, uh, there's pr three areas, and I kind of mentioned these briefly with uh, Senator Wicker, but um, how we're changing in unmanned aerial systems or unmanned systems overall and then countering those and EW um, is it th the battlefield is changing in, in weeks and months. And so the, the point is for systems, and I'll give you an example. Um, when October 7th happened, Hamas attacked Israel, um, situation um, changed in the Middle East and we needed to do additional things with counter UAS. Um, we, we did not have the flexibility because of a continuing resolution to move money, make adjustments, um, go from R&D to procurement for, for certain systems. And so I, I do think in those three areas, just is how fast, and we're not talking big systems, that we need more flexibility in those areas because of how things are, are changing. And I'm, I'm confident that we could do that in a way where we would notify and wait um, and to tell in, inside those systems. So those are the three areas that I think we would need the flexibility. But just to clarify, the fundamental problem there is budget certainty and making sure that's, that you're not operating on a continuing resolution that's, on an ongoing basis. Right. That was, we could not make adjustments and we couldn't up our production level for Coyote, for example, and had to go through things. But I do think in those three areas that we, we do need some flexibility for counter, like counter UAS systems, we were in R&D and have the ability to procure some of those. I think it's also gonna help for a lot of the small technology firms that are doing great things um, here in the, in the states. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Shane. Senator Fisher, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you both for being here today. General George, your unfunded priority list included uh, several counter UAS systems that you just touched on with Senator Shaheen. Can you tell us why it is important to acquire these systems in fiscal year 25, if not sooner? Um, Senator, I think that uh, you, you've seen with just what happened last weekend with a number of you know systems and unmanned systems and one-way attack and loitering munitions. I think every formation out there is going to have to uh, operate um, these unmanned systems inside of our own formation, and we're gonna to have to be able to counter them. And so um, we, we need to, I think that's one area where I think we're gonna to have to speed up and we're attempting to do that, wanting to do that inside the Army. Well, I appreciated that you put it on your um, unfunded priority list because it is extremely um, important, extremely helpful. As you said, we just uh, witnessed some of that last week. Uh, General and Madam Secretary, we've seen the unmanned aerial systems. We've seen the counter UAS systems to be used uh, to great effect. And we've seen them particularly in Ukraine. So how is the Army taking what it has learned specifically in that conflict about drone, drone, wealth, drone warfare and incorporating those lessons learned into the development of new tactics, techniques, and procedures for soldiers. Sure, Senator Fisher. Um, we first of all, we we are um, aggressively collecting lessons learned from what we're seeing in Ukraine across the board. I was actually in Grafenvir in February and saw some of the training we were doing with the Ukrainians. And frankly, I felt like our soldiers might have been learning more from them than they were learning from us. Um, what we are doing is you know, taking all of those lessons and infusing them into our combat training centers, so at Fort Irwin and at Fort Johnson, and you are actually seeing the, the, what we call the op four, you know, the opposition force that our brigades train against. They are attacking our brigades that are in the box with drones and with drone swarms. So we are, we are already you know, testing our brigades um, against the kinds of things that we're seeing in Ukraine. And they are, that is causing them to adjust their tactics, techniques, and procedures. As the chief said, they're having to move their command posts you know, more frequently. They're having to camouflage them. We're having to find ways to reduce the footprint, both physical and sort of signature. But we are very much trying to learn those lessons. As someone said, you know, a, a lesson observed is not the same thing as a lesson learned. Thank you. Um, also, all of the data that we're seeing indicates that military recruiting remains a challenge. You also touched on that in your openings. 
Um, I do appreciate the efforts that you have made, those ongoing efforts, and and to help create solutions so that we can maintain our all-volunteer force. Uh, Madam Secretary, your joint written testimony outlines the Army's plan for transforming the recruiting enterprise in part through a focus on innovation. How will the Army work to quickly take the successful approaches and incorporate them into a wider recruiting enterprise? Well, we're creating an innovation, essentially, cell or directorate that will be part of U.S. Army Recruiting Command, and they are doing everything from helping us, you know, figure out how to develop the pipeline to train the new, what we call 42 Tango, that will be the kind of specialized enlisted recruiters that will come in. So they're involved with the curriculum development, they're involved with helping us figure out how to apply um, artificial intelligence and machine learning to, again, looking at large data sets of potential prospects and really trying to um, help our recruiters focused on the most, uh, the best leads, if you will. Uh, they're helping us uh, look at basically what we would call the recruiting station of the future. Uh, we, we really think we need to sort of fundamentally relook everything from sort of the storefronts to kind of how our recruiting stations operate. So those are just a few examples of how the innovation cell will help us. You know, I'm really concerned about what I perceive as a growing distrust of institutions in, in our society and especially with our younger generation. Are you looking uh, specifically at ways to uh, address that as well and, and to be able to uh, communicate better about um, the strength of a, of a commitment and dedication and how important that is and, and just the value of the institution? We are, Senator. Uh, you know, I share your concern about the decline of trust that our young people have, and frankly, a lot of Americans have in our uh, institutions. You know, I think what we can do in the Army is, um, you know, continue to do more to talk about the value of service and what it means to be part of an institution that's about something larger than yourself and about protecting this great country. But that I think, frankly, it's something that we need your help on, all of you, uh, because I, I think we need more voices in leadership talking about the value of service. It can't just be, you know, the fact that 83% of our recruits come from military families, that's wonderful in many ways, but it's also a little concerning. You know, we need to, we can't rely on just military families to give their kids to the Army. So the more all of you, I think, can talk about the value of service, that will help us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Fisher. Senator Horono, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you both for your testimony. Secretary Wormuth, the Army is uh, negotiating renewals for several training, very important training area, area land leases in Hawaii, particularly Pohakaloa on the Big Island. Uh, in that training area, uh, that would be the Army and the, the Marines, uh, not to mention our um, our civil, our civilian people. So anyway, we're in the midst of negotiating, although those leases do not expire for a number of years, but we do need to be already in the process. The lands that this training area, particularly Pohakaloa, um, hold cultural significance to the Native Hawaiian community, and it is imperative that you and your team conduct frequent and respectful engagements with the local community leaders, especially the Native Hawaiian community, because uh, truly we need to uh, avoid a situation where uh, the, there is major conflict in terms of our ability to extend these leases. So I included a provision in last year's NDAA that requires the Secretary of Defense to designate an official responsible for coordinating these negotiations has that individual been identified? And could you provide an update on the lease renegotiation efforts and community outreach? Certainly, Senator Hirono. Um, I am tracking that requirement uh, in the last NDAA. Um, I do not believe that OSD has yet hired that individual. I know that, you know, we have had discussions with them about the attributes that would be helpful in that kind of person. You know, obviously someone who has deep ties to the community and relationships with all of the different stakeholders. 
Uh, but I think OSD is still working to identify the right person for that. You know, we certainly think it would be helpful to have someone be a, a single belly button, if you will. Mm -hmm. What we're doing in the Army is really to try to have exactly the kinds of conversations that you're referring to uh, with all of the different stakeholders. So General Flynn has been very engaged. My assistant secretary, our assistant secretary for installations and the environment, uh, Rachel Jacobson. We've had our general counsel, Carrie Ricci, has been out to Hawaii to have conversations. And, you know, as you said, the leases don't expire until 2029, but we need to be having discussions about what the options are. And I think there are discussions informally with the Department of uh, Land and Natural Resources, for example. So we're, we're trying to continue to stay focused on that. I cannot overstate the importance of uh, finding the right person to be the, that uh, liaison with the community. Uh, let me give you an example. The Maui wildfires has resulted in the, the family of what I describe as the family of federal agencies there. Over a thousand federal people have been there on Maui and FEMA, of course, is very much there. And as FEMA is conducting its cleanup operations and all of that, they have hired dozens, dozens of cultural advisors to be there when they are actually cleaning out individual lots. That is how critically important the sensitivities are. And uh, I would say that if we do not re renegotiate these leases successfully, uh, that is going to have a major impact on the continuing presence of the military in Hawaii and therefore our national security. So we've talked a lot about um, recruiting and all of the services are having recruiting challenges except possibly the Air Force. So some of the new things that you are doing, is this something that is being shared with the other services because they're all facing recruiting challenges? Yes, uh, I'm proud to say the Army is leading the way in this space uh, and our sister services are, are taking you know, a, a page from our playbook. So I believe the Navy, for example, has started their own version of the future soldier prep course. Secretary Austin has regular conversations with the service chiefs and secretaries and we're, we're sharing our lessons learned and what's working for us and what's not working in some cases. Well, when you noted that uh, we can't continue to rely on the recruits coming from um, military families, over 80%, and that, that uh, the value of service uh, is, is, needs to be something that all of us uh, talk about and uh, uh, express our support for civic education is, I would say, a very much a part of all of this. And as you are recruiting, I assume that you're recruiting from a, a diverse population. So frankly, diversity, equality, inclusion, those are uh, important aspects of what I, I can consider to be the, the military's approach to uh, how they're going to, how you are going to successfully recruit, even as we are facing challenges to uh, exposing uh, our military people to DEI. So I am among those who very much support uh, the DOD's efforts uh, to expand uh, to the to uh, populations um, who are underrepresented, I would say. One more thing, uh, I focus very much on the, the need for our, our repairing our, frankly, crumbling infrastructure in the military. And uh, the Indo-Pacific region, U.S. Army Pacific, all, estimates the total cost of repair of all of their facilities runs in the billions and while I'm encouraged to see the Army's overall budget for military construction has increased by $1 billion this year, uh, there's still obviously a lot, of, a lot more work we have to do. So what is the Army's long-term plan to replace our, uh, and repair our crumbling infrastructure in Hawaii and the Indo-Pacific? Uh, very briefly, Senator, we have $200 billion a year in this year's budget request for infrastructure specifically in Hawaii. Uh, as you noted, that is um, a down payment, I would say. And the, you know, the Army has an enormous in inventory of infrastructure worldwide, and so we don't have the resources to tackle everything everywhere all at once. And we use our facilities investment planning process every year to try to help us prioritize, uh, and that's a 15-year plan. But we are we do have a focus on infrastructure in Hawaii. Well, one of the things I noticed Thank is... You, Senator. Uh, oh. Oh, I'm sorry. I will send some questions for the record. 
Thank you very much, Senator Reno. Senator Ernst, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, General George and Secretary Warmoth, for being here today. And, and I do appreciate your leadership and your dedication to maintaining the readiness of our great United States Army. Um, we know we're in a very tough security environment, so thank you both for being here. Um, General George, I will start with you, and it's going right back to Iowa. Um, as you know, the Iowa Army Ammunition Plant means a lot to our Iowans, and we are proud of the men and women who serve there daily. They continue to indirectly support our efforts alongside those of our allies and partners all around the globe, including Ukraine and Israel. And as we recently discussed, the Army introduced a significant modernization plan to the facility in Middletown, Iowa. How confident are you that these initiatives will adequately meet the Army's and our future needs and serve as a foundational step in enhancing our domestic industrial base from Iowa? Um, Senator, I think if there's a silver lining in all the um, what's been happening in the world, it's that we've realized that we needed to improve our organic industrial base, and we're we're moving out on that. Um, I have been to the Iowa Ammunition Plant. We're gonna. It's planned to invest 280 million um, to modernize. It's a good example of what we need to do. And I was I was recently down in Radford. The same thing. You can modernize, have the same workforce, but you can greatly expand your production, which is what we need to be able to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I, we're really proud of our um, OIB workforce. Everywhere we go, they're just so patriotic. Um, and those communities are so patriotic and, and we need them. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And it's uh, for those that, that might be watching or catching this um, later on, uh, the Iowa Army Ammunition Plant produces the 155 munitions that are so uh, talked about through the news today. Um, General George, I'd like to focus on commercial technology as well. Um, so we just recently saw the cancellation of the FARA program, our future attack reconnaissance aircraft. Um, and that came as a, a big surprise to a lot of folks. Uh, but uh, the lessons that we are learning in Ukraine are really demonstrating the significance of embracing a much lighter, more agile, and cost-effective aerial reconnaissance solution. Um, and, and again, for perspective, what we're seeing in Ukraine with smaller unmanned drones, um, it, it makes sense. And this is one of those times that I know we have spent a couple billion dollars on this program, but I'd rather see it stop right there um, if it's not going to meet the needs of tomorrow. Um, so, General George, um, can you describe innovative ways the Army partners with the commercial sector to field and leverage commercial technology, technology that will work for us tomorrow? Um, Senator, there's a lot of examples, and um, I think what we're seeing in the world today is that there's a lot of areas where commercial tech is is what we're doing in the military. You look at unmanned systems and Amazon, Home Depot, people that are building these things. The network is another example and of how we can do with transport and satellites. Um, so we're trying to embrace all of that. I think the biggest changes that we're doing are with our network, what we're doing to um, reduce the systems that we have, make sure that we're more mobile, more low signature, and we're doing that with a lot of commercial off-the-shelf um, capabilities because you can now have a tablet with apps and software. Mm -hmm. It's also cheaper than to update that. Um, unmanned systems is another one that we're doing, and um, I think we, we're getting to the point because other people are out there, you can also 3D print. So we want modular open system architecture systems that we can adjust sensors with, um, and we're, a lot of that is happening. You know, the actual bus or the UAS um, commercial technology is moving very rapidly on that, so I think we can learn a lot from that and pull that into our formation. Right, I appreciate that, and I, I think it's important that we take a look at the constrained budgetary environment that we operate in today and try and do more with what already exists out there, and we're seeing this in many instances with the constrained budgetary environments that we see in, in Ukraine, 
in Israel and other places around the world. So um, I am running out of time, but Secretary Wormuth too, I really appreciate you asking all of these great folks to be a voice as well. Um, there are a lot of really incredible young men and women that are out there. We need to be able to reach them and encourage them into service. Um, but thank you both very much for your service. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Ernst. Senator King, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to start with three data points. $10,000, $4.3 million, and $12. $10,000 is the high-end estimate of the cost of the, the uh, uh, drones that Iran and the Houthis are using. $4.3 million is the cost of one SM-6 missile, $4 million for the Patriot. $12 is the cost of a directed energy shot that can take down one of these drones, and yet, the entire Defense Department has cut its directed energy budget in this budget. The Army has cut its directed energy budget in this budget. Every agency and department of the Department of Defense has cut its directed energy budget in this budget. What in the hell are you people thinking? Senator King, as we talked about, um, we are pursuing directed energy. Why we is the budget cut? I will have to look at the specifics of whether we've made cuts. I know, you know we've shifted money from RDT and E into procurement because in many cases a lot of our systems are coming online now and so we're not, this year's budget doesn't show as much in RDT and E. But we are, our four prototypes for our directed energy MSHORE ad system are out in CENTCOM right now. Uh, General Carrilla is testing them in that environment for exactly the reasons that you allude to. You know, they have a lot of promise in terms of being we're, much we're more cost effective. We're shooting down $10,000 drones with $4 million missiles. They, <laughs> they can uh, drain our bank account on that ratio if, in not too long. Uh, the same thing with uh, uh, in, uh, in, in Israel. I mean, the, the th three of the conflicts we're observing right now are d indirectly engaged in, Ukraine, Iran, and the Houthis, are all about air defense, and yet I just can't understand the Defense Department not having its hair on fire about directed energy, and, and, and since 2023, the directed energy budget has declined de uh, department-wide, and I appreciate that you are testing some of these units, but this ought to be one of the highest, most urgent priorities uh, both in terms of cost, but also in terms of effectiveness. General, would you be able to effectively use directed energy if it were available to take down some of these uh, aerial uh, attack uh, vehicles? I think what, what we're looking at, Senator, is um, a lot of different options to include high-powered microwave, lasers. I mean, we're looking, it's going to be a layered defense of what we're doing. Um, as the Secretary mentioned, we put we put the uh, prototypes that we have. We're sending everything that we have available over to the Middle East uh, and testing it in those kind of environments. And we're still working through, I will tell you, you know, some well, of this stuff on the naval, directed energy. There's a naval San Diego instead of in the Red Sea. I just don't understand why this isn't a higher priority. And, 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 and budgets are policy. And if the budget for directed energy in the department has gone down substantially over the last f four or five years, that's an indication of, of a policy that I just don't understand. Uh, let me move on to, to a couple of other topics, uh, more specific. I hope that you will continue research on the effects of blasts on your people. We had a tragedy in Lewiston, Maine uh, last year, and it turns out that the fellow was a was a uh, munitions test uh, instructor. He experienced blast after blast after blast. Analysis of his brain indicates that it was severely damaged. So uh, please attend to that risk because uh, it, it, is, it is now clearly contributing to the tragedy that we had, but also suicide and long-term damage to our soldiers. That's Senator, I'd say uh, a couple things on that. One, starting this June, we will be doing a cognitive assessment on every new soldier coming into basic training so that we set- so have a baseline. To set a baseline, exactly, to what, you know, to where they are before they start getting exposed as they go do training. High school football teams have been doing that for years, by the way. It's nice that we're well, starting. we're going to start doing it uh, this June, again, every single new soldier. We are also uh, looking at what additional 
personal protective equipment we can provide to our folks, especially instructors and others who are routinely exposed to blast pressure. We are also looking into wearable gauges that would allow us to continuously track what soldiers are being exposed to. The challenge we've had to date is we haven't been able to find sufficiently ruggedized gauges, so we need to do some more work on that, but I... If the gauges can't stand the blast, what does that say about the soldier's brain? Well, I, it's more that the gauges, I, as I understand it, you know, didn't do very well in, in sort of field environments, but I know uh, Special Operations Command has um, some wearable gauges on their UPL list, and I think we'll be looking at sort of what they're um, hoping to invest in. But we are very attentive to the brain-induced injury issues. I'm very delighted to hear that. Thank you very much, and keep up that emphasis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator King. Senator Tuberville, please. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for both of you for your service. Um, <clears throat> I'm worried more about our people. You know, I, come, I came from a team-oriented uh, background. And we're going to have the weapons. Uh, we're borrowing $80,000 a second right now to pay for all those weapons, so I don't know what our our kids are going to have to do in the future, but we need to protect us, our country, and our allies. But I'm very concerned about uh, the people that are within our military. Uh, I've had a chance to go to bases all over, in country and out of country, all over the world. And I try to ask for a uh, kind of a, a group session with officers and non-commissioned officers and talk, talk to them. A lot of good things, a lot of things that are not so good. Uh, a lot of them concerned in the last few years about some of their fellow service members that uh, didn't make the cut because they didn't take the vaccine. Uh, Secretary Warmoth, we, we've lo we lost 1,861 service members uh, and 200 people that basically were, were mechanics in the military. Or did we have a backup plan for that, uh, especially for the mechanics that we lost, uh, going, you know, that, that we very desperately need in times like this? Senator, I think, um, you know, again, one way we try to deal with shortfalls in any particular MOS is to increase our recruiting in that area. You know, obviously, None of us anticipated the pandemic. None of us anticipated uh, many of the different effects. But the percentage of soldiers who were released from the Army because they didn't take the COVID vaccine was very, very small out of our formation. Yeah. Well, 2,000 people would is a lot of people as we look at it today in recruiting. Um, and I think it's important. We need, we need to look at our shortfalls when it comes to that. Also talk to a, a lot of our service members that are out of the mil military, as we speak, a lot of special ops, a lot of rangers, a lot of them are very disgruntled about the things that they were being taught at the end of their service, DEI. If I had to use DEI when I was coaching, I'd have been fired a long time ago. Uh, we, I don't think you can run a military off of diversity, equity, and inclusion. I think you do it with the best, the meanest, the people that, are, that we need to train to fight to defend this country. What's your thoughts on that, General George? Um, Senator, I would be my, honest about this now. Yeah, we're I'm, I'm we're in trouble. Be, um, I, I will tell you, and you can ask uh, any of the formation we go out and I'm talking to them. We're focused on building war fighting, you know, increasing lethality in our units and building cohesive teams. So as you know, from um, being a coach, when you're bringing everybody together too, you also bring every, you got, we got people coming from all over the country. So. I've been ta you know, talking about building cohesive teams since I was a brand new private when I was instructed on that coming right out, um, all the way of being a leader. So I think that those are the two things that we're focused on. It's obviously different in uh, in every form, you know, in different formations that I've been in, in different levels. But that's what we need to be focused on. Yeah, and, and you're, yeah, and you're finding out that it's hard to bring people from different backgrounds to put them together to make a mesh as a unit, as a team, and their lives are on at stake. Uh, it's not a football player, you know, playing to win or lose a game. It's, you know, their, their loss in the military is losing their life. Uh, and I just want to make sure we, you know, we live in a dangerous world, as we all know. Uh, I, I think that uh, I would love to be giving you all this $100 billion that we're getting ready to send overseas to our military, uh, to the people to try to get more people in the military. I think we need to look more at us than we do at other people. I can understand why we're doing this. But 
I think we're going to have shortfalls in the long run uh, when it comes to that. Uh, uh, General, are we taking uh, illegals into our military in the Army? Um, I think what we're taking it, you have to be a legally um, per legal permanent resident or a resident of our country to enlist um, in the Army, Senator. Do you know, Mr. Secretary, are we taking illegals in our, mil in our in the Army? As the Chief said, uh, you have to be a lawful permanent resident or a resident of the United States to join the military. Resident or a citizen? Uh, lawful permanent. I'm, you know, I'm not the State Department, but lawful permanent resident. I think is a is a immigration status that is not full citizenship, yeah. but it is certainly not an undocumented person. Yeah. Well, I, I would just hope that we would take people that love this country. I know there's probably a lot of people come across the border that's going end up loving our country. Uh, I can understand that, but uh, you know, having people that really understand, you know, what that flag means is pretty important in our military. So. I would hope that we would really consider the options, you know, if it came down to that. So thank, thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, thank you, Senator Tuffville. Senator Kane, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to our witnesses. General George, I appreciate uh, our visit to Radford a couple weeks back, uh, looking at that World War II era old facility, but cutting edge work is being done there. You spoke with Senator Ernst a bit about this, but talk about the need to, um, increase our capacity to produce munitions. General Cavoli was here the other day and was talking about uh, European nations upping their production capacity, but talk about what we're doing in the Army to increase munition production. Um, Senator, uh, same as in Iowa, what we're, you know, down the Patriot, Patriots that are down there, um, and Radford, for example, what it does down there just with uh, energetics and explosives is critical, not only just to the Army, but really the joint force. Um, so that all of our uh, base organic industrial depots and arsenals are, are critically important. And it's important. A lot of what's in the supplemental um, is actually going to go back to improving those um, facilities, which we need to do. So we're, we're investing in our own base. I think we have 640 million that's in there to get after projects. And I know there's one down at um, Radford, but we have to modernize those, and, and we're starting to do a little bit of that at Radford, but we got um, more work to do. Uh, you, you raise a good point. The supplemental isn't just about um, overseas support. About $130 million in the supplemental is going to Radford for munitions production, and there are similar investments being made at, at munitions facilities around the country. Um, I do want to uh, start uh, by recognizing the men and women of the 7th Transportation Brigade at Joint Base Langley Eustis in Virginia. Uh, they are uh, on their way to answering the call and deploying into the Mediterranean in support of the humanitarian aid efforts on the pier construction in the Eastern Mediterranean, and I just wanted to mention them. Um, future soldier, I want to ask you, Secretary Warmoth, we've talked about this before. Share a little bit more about this program. As I understand it, and you really are, the Army is leading in this way, taking folks who want to be in the military but who may not meet some of the physical uh, criteria, but you are doing good work in designing this pre-course that enables somebody to meet uh, the physical criteria to enter the Army. What are you finding out about their ability to not just meet but then sustain uh, the physical capacity as they have enlisted? Thanks, Senator Kane. Uh Yes, there's, there's first, there's two tracks in the Future Soldier Prep course. There's an academic track for young people who haven't quite scored high enough on the test that we use. And then there's a physical track if you're not quite within the body fat standards. So young people can take one or the other. We now have expanded it and they can take them in parallel. We've graduated, I think, almost 18,000 young people out of this program. It's like a 95% success rate. Uh, they often are going into basic training and taking on sort of leadership roles in basic training. So uh, it's been very, very successful so far. And we are um, doing a longitudinal study to follow graduates from the prep course, you know, as they go to their first duty station and have their first set of assignments to see how they perform. But right now, it's been a, a very good program at both Fort Jackson and Fort Moore. Excellent. Um, we had a hearing about a year ago sticking on the recruiting, and the Army had done a really good survey of reasons people will join or not. And one of the things that surprised me was the sort of top listed reason why someone might not join the military is the fear of falling behind their peers. 
Um, there's sort of an attitude of, okay, I'm an 18-year-old. I've got some friends maybe going off to college or others that may be starting careers. I'd like to serve my country. I, 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 I see that it has a patriotic advantage, but I worry that five or 10 years down the road when I exit the military or 20 years down the road, my peers will have moved farther ahead and I won't. And so making the case to young people that a military career isn't a cul-de-sac or detour from life success, but it enhances possible future careers seems to be really, really important as you're approaching retooling, recruiting, how are you kind of factoring that in? Well, one of the things we're trying to do is really get the word out in part through our marketing about, you know, how that, that is basically a myth that you're going to be left behind. I mean, we, we have the GI Bill. We have certification programs so that soldiers can, own, can earn, you know, certificates that are marketable when they leave. And what we've really tried to do is to have some of our marketing efforts really focus on that and kind of getting that information out there. And that's obviously something that we make sure that our recruiters are well versed in so they, they can talk to young people and frankly their parents and other important Great. influencers about all of the benefits to joining the Army. Great. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Kane. Uh, Senator Rounds, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Wormuth, General George, thank you for being with us today. We appreciate your service to our country. Uh, Secretary Wormuth, the Army will play a pivotal role in the Western Pacific as the department lead for the contested logistics problem set. Congress has been providing bipartisan support and funding for Project Pele, micro-nuclear reactor. Uh, does the Army have any plans to transition the Pele technology and regulatory approach for either operational or installation energy resiliency solutions? Well, we certainly are very focused on um energy and resilience at our installations and being able to operate in a more resilient manner. Uh, we are interested, I think, in the potential of micro-nuclear reactors, and I'm familiar with the Project Pele project. Uh, I, I think, you know, we are looking at, and I think we'll soon be entering into some discussions, some informational discussions with industry to learn more about what might be possible, because certainly to the extent that we're able to have a reliable um, source of energy if we have, you know, if the electric grid in many of our communities goes down for some reason, it certainly would be appealing to have something that's dependable and reliable. So we're interested in exploring that, but I would say we're still in the early stages. Thank you. General George, can you describe for the committee how the FY25 budget request takes into consideration the Army's lead role in addressing the contested logistics problem for the department and the Joint Forces sustainment needs. I'm thinking particularly with regard to the year 2027. Um, I'd like your professional military opinion. Do you see, do you believe that the Army will be able to fulfill its role and meet those requirements? Um, Senator, I do. Obviously, this is something that we're working on um, very diligently. We're increasing. We just stood up a, a watercraft company, for example, um, over in Japan. Throughout this next TAA total army analysis, we're looking at um, two additional. Um, we're investing in the LSV, you know, some of the same capability that's getting ready to go over. Um, that's out in the Mediterranean um, right now. I, I will say that this is a joint mission that we're, you know, that we're getting after with that, just like we're doing that mission. We have rehearsed those, so that's, I think, the other thing that we have to do. Um, we have uh, are in this next budget 200% increase in our exercising. Obviously, testing, doing all these things through exercises is where we learn. We're going to be yes. also doing it with partners and allies. And then we're also taking a look at overall what we need to do with, uh, um, for example, on watercraft, what can unmanned systems provide? What can we do with leasing? Um, Preposition stocks is a part of this. So I think we're looking at this holistically and we have a stood up here this just this last fall, um, a uh, contested logistics cross-functional team that is really focused on that. Um, for the whole Army. How about with regard to the different nations involved in the status of forces agreements and so forth? Are those coming together? Are you, are you talking, Senator, like where we would maybe station something or what our forward posture would be? Yeah, and, and I'm curious whether the, the uh, 
with regard to the agreements themselves and so forth, uh, the, the Army takes a role, but does the State Department participate in those in those discussions as well? Um, obviously, that would a lot of that is going to be led by the by the ambassador, by the State Department. It's going to happen across the uh, interagency, and I think. Um, you know, a good example of, um, you know, great partnership that we have right now um, is what's, you know, what, how we've expanded with the Philippines or what we've continued to do but those, um, with those, those partners. But th those particular agreements and so forth are in line for being able to, to, to meet the needs by the year 2027. Obviously, that's that's our focus is is moving out quickly in all of those, and I think that's an a, I know it's a department led, um, and Indopaycom, and but really it's the the whole interagency center. Very good, thank you, um, Secretary Warmoth. The Army established the Joint Counter Small Unmanned Aircraft Systems Office back in 2019 to coordinate counter UAS development across the force. The top two items on your unfunded priorities list are the counter UAS items. Now, Senator King makes a really good point when he talks about the costs involved. Can you share any information about the JCO's role in General Brown's counter UAS task force? Sure. Uh, first of all, I want to say, you know, since 2020, the Army's invested about $3 billion in counter UAS. So we are very focused on that. We've spent more than any other service the, the Joint Capabilities Office is really, their job is to go out for the whole department and work with industry to kind of bring forward what's possible so that we can start investing in sort of the best available technology and then each service decides what they want to buy. Uh, but, but it is playing a key role. We're also standing up a joint counter UAS university at Fort Sill in Oklahoma, again, to help us learn. Uh, and and I would let the chief speak to sort of the the UASs that are on his unfunded priority list. Yes, Senator. So what we did um, again, I, I had mentioned up front on the unfunded priorities list. It's stuff that's executable um, and specific to the counter UAS. It's what's what we've seen change since um, October seventh last fall, and you know we've had some advancements in some of that. Um, we know that that environment and those systems are changing very rapidly. Um, so there was one system on there um, specifically that we wanted was Roadrunner. Um, we want to, there's additional missiles that we need, like Coyote missiles that we know are very, very effective, but we need to increase our magazine depth. So those are the kinds of things that were on there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator Brown. Senator Warren, please. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Our military families sacrifice a lot uh, to serve their country and to keep Americans safe. And one thing they shouldn't have to worry about is whether they're going to have a safe and affordable place to live. We provide basic housing allowance and other assistance to make sure that military families have what they need, but often that is just not enough. For example, the commander at Fort Carson in Colorado has 26,000 people working on post, but he is able to offer only 3,100 family housing units. What's available off base is often very expensive or requires a very long commute to get there, all because we simply don't have enough housing for our people. So Secretary Warmoth, you oversee everything for the Army, from personnel to equipment. Do you think that meeting military families' housing needs is important, both for recruiting and retaining a strong military? Absolutely, it's very important. Okay, I agree with you. And that's why Congress created the Defense Community Infrastructure Program to help communities address, and I'm going to read, deficiencies in community infrastructure supportive of a military installation. Now, DSIP provides grants to local governments for transportation, building, and other infrastructure projects. Secretary Warman, would you support using this program to build more housing in communities near bases in order to help us continue, <clears throat> excuse me, to attract the best and brightest to serve in our military? Um, Senator Warren, this is a program that's run by OSD, and like you said, it's generally grants to communities. So I know we, we do use it for things like assessments of utilities and things like that in partnership with, uh, with communities where we have our installations. 
Uh, you know, I think additional authority for housing is is always helpful. The the real challenge, though, with housing is money. Uh, you know, I, at the end I of the day, I understand that, but you don't get what you don't ask for here. <laughs> so let's start with the idea of recognizing we are in a housing crisis and making this a priority in terms of getting funding in for housing for our military. Does that work for you? Yes, and we're certainly trying to find, you know, for example, with our privatized housing partners, we're trying to find more ways to help oh, get money I'm, into I'm that portfolio. Okay, I'm coming to them. Let me mention one other problem here. I have concerns about the safety of the housing we provide to service members and their families. Now, Congress recently adopted reforms to address housing deficiencies, including requiring the DOD to create a public complaint database to put a stop to government contractors acting like slumlords and then hiding settlements when they get caught. I got that bill passed five years ago, five years, and today DOD still does not have that database up and operational. Even worse, these government contractors continue to muzzle military families by requiring them to sign non-disclosure agreements so there is no record of the mold or the broken windows or the water damage or the rats or any other unsafe housing conditions that military families are forced to put up with. Secretary Warmoth, do you think it is appropriate for government contractors to ask military families to stay silent in return for those companies meeting their basic obligations to provide safe housing? We encourage our soldiers and their families to use the dispute resolution process. Yeah, well, the part the I'm max. worried about are the non-disclosure agreements that come out of that, the NDAs. What, what I would say about that, Senator, is I think, you know, we, we appreciate the provision that you put in that basically requires that their soldiers have 10 days before they're even asked to sign an NDA. And what we do is offer a lawyer that the Army will pay for to advise our soldiers and family members of their rights before they contemplate signing an NDA. I appreciate that that's better than it used to be, but it's not as good as it ought to be. Last year's NDAA put in restrictions on the use of non-disclosure agreements. I just think we're going to have to set a much brighter line. No landlord should be able to make military families sign NDAs in exchange for providing basic housing, period. No NDAs on that. Before I close, I want to say one other thing, and I'll just say it quickly, and that's to you, General George. There is a significant disconnect between Army rhetoric and action. When you were confirmed, you told this committee, quote, I will make every effort to honor our commitment by providing quality barracks to our soldiers. Sounded great. But on your unfunded priorities list, the list of things that you were not willing to fight for for funding in your basic budget, right near the bottom of your unfunded priorities list is money to repair the barracks in Fort Devens, Massachusetts. You can't stand up and say you care about housing your people and then not make housing repairs a part of your base budget. There's no surprise here. It, it was deteriorating and deteriorating over a long period of time. So I want to work with the Army on this. I know I'm over time. But we've got to stop playing games on this and follow through. We have to deliver better housing for our people. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Warren. Senator Budd, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And again, thank you both for being here. Uh, Secretary Warmoth, um, I sent you a letter regarding the Joint Deployment Warfighting Complex at Fort Liberty. You sent me a prompt response, so thank you for that. And it was really about consolidating the 18th Airborne Corps headquarters into a single modern building. Um, the 18th Airborne Corps, it's spread out over 26 facilities. It's on 40 acres. And it really wasn't um, designed to support the, the headquarters' current mission to rapidly respond to contingencies around the world, particularly not with the IT systems, the cyber resiliency requirements that we have today. So understand this project, it's slated to uh, reach 35% planning and design over the next six months. So my question to you is, will you commit to keeping this committee updated on this project's timeline? Yes, certainly, Senator Bunn. Thank you. And I understand it's going to compete with other Army requirements, but this is a top priority, not just to 
um, North Carolina and to Fort Liberty, but from an operational and readiness perspective for the whole of Army. So if you would, please. Thank you. Uh, General George, again, thank you for being here. I appreciated our discussion earlier in the week. Um, the Army has selected Fort Liberty as home of its fifth multi-domain task force. Is that correct, sir? That's correct, Senator. Yes. Thank you. Uh, can you elaborate on the capabilities of these multi-domain task forces and where we are in building these out? Yes. Um, so we're at various stages um, right now. I was actually the commander up at JBLM. We had the first MDTF. So what um, and the big piece that will go in and that we will build and I think will be important for 18th Airborne Corps, the 82nd, really everybody that's there. Um, is the effects battalion that will go in that will have cyber space um, EW so all lethal targeting and non-lethal that's a part of that which I think is critically important um, also part of MDTFs and we're stationing these in, in, in different areas but there's also long long-range fires um, indirect uh, fire protection capabilities and a support battalion Liberty is really important to us. Obviously, what you were just talking about with what it it's, does to support the joint force and rapid response and looking. So having that capability there in the, the space that, that you have. And the um, we also get some economies of scale with all of the, given it's a large base with all the other MOSs that we're going to put there. Thank you. You know, on a different topic, we've talked a lot about uh, counter UAS. Um, so to add on to that, clarify for me, is it purely additional resources that you need, General, or are there new authorities there that would be helpful? I know we talked a little bit about this on Monday. I, th I think, well, there's two aspects of this. Um, for some of the authorities, for us specifically, is being able to um, re you know, go from research and development to actually procuring things, what I was talking about. Um, I think if you're coming back stateside and you're looking at actually defending airfields and critical infrastructure, there are some additional things. I think NORTHCOM right now is doing uh, a study kind of on what that is because there's obviously, a, it's an interagency challenge when you're looking at, um, you know, small UASs that are operating here um, stateside. But um, thank you for us and, and forward, I think we're in a good place. Thank you. You know, North Carolina is also proud home of the 30th Armored Brigade Combat Team, and I'm aware of planned upgrades to their Abram tanks, but also, also I'm interested in whether we'll see a replacement for Bradley Infantry Fighting Vehicles. What's the status of the XM-30 program? Um, I w I've had the, we just went through the, you know, the requirement and going through this. It's, uh, I, we do need to upgrade our infantry fighting vehicle. We're going through the process of that. I do think that that will be a significant leap forward um, for us. And I'll have somebody come over and kind of brief you the detailed timeline on, on what we're looking at that. If you would, please. Thank you. Um, Madam Secretary, I'd like to talk about munitions that are going to be critical in the conflict in the Indo-Pacific. I'm thinking the precision strike missiles and guided MLRS rockets. My first question is, have you identified any production lines that have additional capacity? And if so, which ones? Well, we do, you know, we're using multi-year procurement authority that you all gave us for Gimler. So I think there's more capacity there. Precision strike missile, we have funding in this year's budget for sort of the first wave of precision strike missile. I think at this point, we don't have additional capacity. We're still sort of, that program is, is still in the beginning of its effort. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Senator. But, <clears throat> Senator Kelly, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Warmoth, I want to follow up on um, Senator Budd's uh, question about munitions, but um, you know, real, really, you know, concerns we have with our defense industrial base, and um, you know, industry is struggling to produce enough to support um, even the limited conflict. In Ukraine, in a conflict with a near peer adversary, we will use munitions much faster uh, than we are having to replace the ones we're sending to Ukraine today. That's clear. It's also clear that more needs to be done to prepare our industrial base for possible future conflict. And one of the keys to bri bridging this gap is what Senator Budd mentioned, which is the multi year procurement 
um, which allows DOD to send a steady demand signal to companies and leads to long-term reductions in acquisition costs. The Army's been taking advantage of multi-year procurement to help replenish stockpiles and ensure that we um, are well postured for future conflicts. Um, so, uh, Secretary Warmoth, can you talk about uh, a little bit more broadly about multi-year contracts and how the Army is currently taking advantage of them to save money and invest in the future? And, and General, please feel free to uh, add anything to her comments. Certainly. Thanks, Senator Kelly. Uh, we have found the multi-year procurement authority to be very helpful for exactly the reason that you said, which is essentially that it it um, sends a very strong demand signal to industry that there's a consistent need for that investment. And they are more willing, frankly, to invest in their own facilitization when they have essentially a guaranteed buy you know, over multiple years. So I think that's been very helpful with both Gimler's and the, the pac 3s And what, what else are we buying in multi-year procurements? Right now, if I'm not mistaken, I think those are the two sets of munitions for which we're using the multi-year. You know, we're we're spending over three billion dollars a year on munitions more broadly, but I think those are the two that we have multi-year authority. Do we for. plan on expanding that to other munitions? I think we've been in conversations at the staff level about a couple more places where that might be uh, applicable. If I'm not mistaken, I think we have to demonstrate, you know, a certain amount of cost savings. Uh, there's a threshold that one has to meet to be able to get multi-year procurement authority. So I think that's kind of where the conversation has been with some of the professional staff. And then, General, do you uh, see uh, our stocks going up at a higher rate than you would have expected without a multi-year on, on those two items? I think, uh, Senator, the multi-years are definitely very helpful to us, and we appreciate it. I think one of the challenges, and I'll just go back to the, you know, during the continuing resolution, if we wanted to increase any, you know, new productions, new starts, we couldn't do, you know, we couldn't do any of that. So we lost time with that. Um, it's why also for the Army, the supplemental is very important um, because we've got, you know, more than $3 billion worth of, of munitions we need to put in there. So I think it's a combination of, of all of those things that are going to help us move forward. And then, General, uh, another subject, um, the Army's uh, working to modernize its airborne ISR capability, divesting in older turboprop planes and investing in more, you know, some more modern aircraft. The new Haiti system is going to be a significant increase in range and capability. It's vital that this new capability is based at a location where the air crew can train for a in a threat environment that's um, similar to what they would face in combat. The new sync signals intelligence capabilities will require that your pilots have regular access to ranges that can simulate the threat they will face in combat. So General, do you agree that access to electronic testing ranges will be vital to ensure that the continued, ensure the continued development and success of Hades? Um, yeah, I, I agree with you 100%, Senator. I was down. I mean, the John R. Fox range is one of those that has it's, has incredible capability um, for us, for the whole Army. And they, the, uh, you know, Fort Huachuca um, right. in southern Arizona, I mean, is you, you need, uniquely positioned to support this mission. It already does RC-12 training. It's got the electronic range, the electronic proving ground. Um, and uh, you don't need to go very far to train because it's right there. You know, it's not like, you know, other bases that I've been at. You have to, you know, make a, a pretty long trek to the range. Um, I, I just want to get your assurances from both you and the Secretary that the Army will consider these factors when deciding basing operations for Hades. We will definitely consider all of those. And uh, just on the Hades, it's from all of the COCOMs are, are very positive about having that asset. Um, supporting them. Right. Secretary? It's the same. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Kelly. Senator Cotton, please. Secretary Wormuth, I want to return to the line of questioning earlier about recruiting. Um, you'd, you've said that you don't want to be overconfident, but you think we have a good shot at making that goal this year, the goal being 55,000. But isn't it the case that you dropped your goal this year because not many people are joining the Army since you joined or since you became the Secretary? 
It's true that our goal last year, Senator Cotton, was 65,000. General McConville and I set that as a stretch goal. That's how we characterized it. So this year, between 55,000 new contracts and 5,000 in the debt, it's 60K. La last year, you forecast that you would need 62,600 for this year. Why did you cut that? Again, we, we look at what's possible, and we set a goal that we think is both. Do you look at what's possible or what's needed? Well, we, General George. What's possible is pretty low since you became the secretary. Actually. But there's a question of what's needed for our army to defend our nation. Senator Cotton, the chief and I are both committed to growing back our end strength. We are aiming to get up to 470,000 by 2029, and our recruiting is improving consistently. Well, well, if it's improving because you're throwing a dart at the wall and then drawing the bullseye around it. In your first full year on the job, the target was 60,000. You didn't even get 45,000. Last year it was 65, you got 55. You had projected last year for it to be 62,600 this year and conveniently you decided just to change the goal to 55,000, which is exactly what you got last year. You don't, you don't think that is a little suspicious? That you're simply trying to avoid negative headlines once again for your failure to meet basic recruiting goals, goals that we've met almost every single year since 2005? I'm not focused on headlines, Senator Cotton. What I'm doing is doing everything possible to help the Army improve its recruiting, does, and that's what we're doing. Does the Army need 7,600 fewer soldiers than you expected this year than you expected it would need last year? The Army has been able to meet all of the requirements that the combatant commands have levied on us at our current end strength, and our end strength is going to start going up. What are, the require, what are the requirements that have changed in the last year from those combatant commands that allowed you to drop your goal, not just from the 65,000 it was last year to 55 this year, but from the 62,600 that you predicted last year that you would need this year? What requirements have decreased on the Army's uh, uh. The requirements haven't changed, and we were able. I wouldn't to, think so, since we the world were, was going up in smoke because of Joe Biden's failed policies. We were able to meet all of the combatant command requirements last year. We've been able to meet them this year, but we're still focused on growing our end strength. I mean, we 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 met our recruiting goals at the height of the pandemic in 2020 and 2021. You can't meet your recruiting goals now without dropping them by 10,000 from what they were last year? All of the services are facing challenges, but I'm proud to say we service have- Service is acute. Your, the challenges for your service are acute. Yes, we ha because we have the biggest force and we have to recruit the largest number. But we are doing considerably I mean, I'm, I'm better every, this year. I'm looking at every single year here. 62-5, 68-5, 76-5, 68-61-2. -5, this is not a systemic problem until you became the secretary. Senator Cotton, I don't think that there's a correlation between me becoming secretary and the recruiting headwinds that the entire department has been facing. Okay, I, I want to touch on another recruiting matter, or I guess a, a four-strength matter. I noticed a, a story in Stars and Stripes from January that there's a shortage of about 250 officers in Adjutant General Finance and Signal Corps, and the Army was going to ask infantry and armor officers to transfer. Has that happened? I'll have to take that for the record. General George, yeah, do you I know can, any more details? I can, yeah. Um, typically, as you know, Senator, we have uh, typically have more combat arms, yeah. lieutenants. Um, so that's, that struck me. Typically, we do VTIP. Um, we've, this was a, done a little bit earlier that we knew because of our structure. We're actually growing some additional MDTF, which came up earlier. Signal is, for example, is one of them, or MI where you typically have more captains and majors than you do lieutenants. So that, that was what that was. And what we did is took volunteers. Um, we just put the message out because um, we want to keep talent. And it's actually really good for us to infuse those branches with people that have experience in the combat so, arms. Yeah, normally things like signal and AG are, are donor branches at the lieutenant ranks to infantry. But I, is infantry officer ranks, whatever the Army as a whole, infantry armor officer ranks are healthy right now at the company they're, level? They're he we're very healthy for, for lieutenants, Senator. We're doing okay, well thank on you. that. One final issue, um, Secretary Wormuth, the caisson platoon. Uh, the Army just acknowledged that they're not on track to get caisson operations back up at Arlington National Cemetery. This has been an ongoing issue now for more than a year. We directed you in the NDAA uh, to make sure the caisson platoon remains in existence. You fought that tooth and nail last year. What is the issue here? It's horses pulling wagons. It's been happening since before recorded time. 
why can't these families who have a right to a horse-drawn case on at their funeral expect that's going to happen? Senator Cotton, first of all, we didn't have any plans to get rid of the case on platoon. We've actually spent well, a lot. You fought my amendment tooth and nail about it. So I don't know what I mean. I don't know if you have a animal rights activist from PETA on your staff handling this issue. But why can't you get horses pulling wagons in the cemetery? There's a range of challenges, and we can come and talk to you the in detail. The Old Guard did this for decades. Yes, and the horses decades. that did that for decades are now old and lame. They've and always been old. They've always been retired from other activities. Well, we are now trying to grow the herd. We have, we have been focused on this incredibly hard. We're looking at additional pasture land. We're going to have to rebuild the stables that you probably remembered. But we are very focused on trying to get to a point where we're able to offer, again, the caisson service if, with the funerals. If the Army, under your leadership, can't figure out horses pulling wagons, it's not a surprise they can't figure out increasing munitions manufacturing or drone warfare. Thank you, Senator Cotton. Senator Peters, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary uh, Wormuth, uh, General George, welcome to the committee, and thank you uh, both uh, for your service uh, to, our, to our country. Um, in response to a uh, question asked by uh, Senator Budd, um, uh, it uh, seems clear that the Army uh, knows uh, that the, uh, the future conflicts that we're going to face, we're going to require some new units, uh, with uh, example is the Army's multi-domain task uh, forces uh, at the very center of those uh, modernization uh, efforts that you are uh, undertaking now. And when forward positions, uh, these uh, MDTFs will ensure freedom of operations uh, for U.S. forces in uh, what are going to be uh, heavily denied environments. As you stand up, my, so my question for both of you is, as you stand up additional uh, uh, MDTFs, I hope that the, the Army will pursue a similar force structure to the Security Force Assistant Brigades, uh, the SFABs. Currently active duty SFABs are aligned with combatant commands, while a National Guard SFAB is globally aligned. So my question specifically to both of you is, are you in conversations with the National Guard about a guard-based uh, MDTF? And if so, what additional analysis is going to be needed prior to making an informed decision on future MDTF uh, force structure? Thank you, Senator Peters. Uh, right now, our plan is to develop five multi-domain task forces, as I think you noted. Uh, we aren't currently uh, thinking about yet having an MDTF in the Guard. The, the MDTFs are very, very new. Uh, I think the first MDTF had come online right as I became uh, secretary, you know, more than three and a half years ago. Uh, we have, it's been a journey. We have been learning. You know, right now we think the five is what we're going to need, but, but we are very much a total army and we're always in conversation with our colleagues in the Guard about you know, um, changes to their force structure as well. So I think it's something that we'll remain open-minded to, but right now our plan is for the five in the active. So there are no active discussions beyond that. Can, can I jump in? Sure, yeah, go ahead, Chief. I would not, I think the secretary exactly on, you know, larger MDTF just because of what we require. What we are, have had some discussions, and I would say these are initial discussions with a lot of the guard leaders, is um, there is a lot of, space capability, cyber. I mean, we get, you know, a lot of capability from that, not just for MDTFs, but in the Garden Reserve and Compo 2 and Compo 3. How do we maximize that capability? You know, how could we have plugs? For example, when I went over to Afghanistan as a division commander, I took it, there was a large number of National Guard folks that were, that built out our intel and targeting just because of their expertise. So that's what we're, that's what we're talking about. Um, and I would just say that those have been preliminary conversations because we know we have capability in the Guard and Reserve. How could they maybe augment some of the stuff that we're doing already? Yeah, great. And it's important that a lot of these uh, members of the Guard have extensive civilian experience and uh, some very high level skill sets that they can bring to their uh, duty. So um, it's good to hear that that's happening. Secretary uh, Wormuth, uh, last week uh, the EPA issued federal drinking water standards for six uh, PFAS uh, chemicals. Uh, these standards include PFAS chemicals previously used by the Army and National Guard in firefighting foams at uh, many installations across the country, but one uh, in particular that I'm focused on is uh, Camp Grayling uh, in Michigan, where PFAS contaminated drinking water is a serious uh, and real concern for the uh, local community, something that folks around the country are dealing with right now. So my question for you, ma'am, is uh, what is the Army's plan and timeline for conforming with these new uh, EPA standards? 
and uh, when can impacted residents uh, in Grayling, Michigan in particular, expect to see some action to conform to these uh, new EPA standards? Thanks, Senator Peters. Yes, I'm broadly aware of the new standards that the EPA has set for uh, PFAS. And I think, you know, um, we've already been working closely with uh, folks at Camp Grayling, which is a great training area, by the way, uh, to work on eradicating PFAS at the previous levels. And I think what I would say is I'd love to send our installations and environment team over to talk to your office in detail about sort of how we'll be approaching the new, um, the new raised level and what the timelines associated with that will be. But we want to continue to be proactive with you all about um, getting into compliance with the EPA standards. Well, that's good. Uh, could we uh, arrange that meeting sooner rather than later? Yes, happy to do that. Right. We appreciate that commitment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Peters. Senator Duckworth, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning to both our witnesses. I'm glad we're having a conversation about the role of the Guard and the Reserve um, uh, because I think they are an important uh, part of our overall force. And right now, um, as you've already acknowledged, National Guard and Reserve Service members have specific qualifications and specific skills that are highly needed. Um, and yet those who have specific qualifications are only paid a fraction of what their active duty counterparts are paid in incentive pay although they maintain the same skill sets. I've consistently advocated for fixing this problem and passed legislation to address its incentive pay disparities several years ago, and we even updated it in last year's NDAA. Bottom line, you get the same two paratroopers who make their three jumps in a single day. The active duty one is gonna get a full month's worth of incentive pay. The guard or reservists will get 1 30th of that incentive pay for the same three jumps that they took. Um, this is fundamentally unfair. Last year's update, section 612 of the FY24 NDAA, was meant to clarify Congress's intent that special and incentive pays should be paid equally to members of the active and reserve components if these pays are intended to encourage reserve component service members to maintain a skill or proficiency identical to that required of the member in the active component, or to compensate the reservists for exposure to hazards or risk identified to hazards or risk faced by an active duty service member. My update from last year requires the service secretaries to go back and review each type of special and incentive pay individually and certify that those pays that meet this criteria to be paid out to members of the reserve component equally, if doing so will not hurt retention. It's starting to feel like I'm being slow rolled. We need to get these pays. I mean, these folks have earned it. They should get the same amount of pay as the active duty folks. The pilots who go out there and maintain their minimum flying hour requirements that are the same as active duty pilots should get a full month's worth of pay. Those, those, those paratroopers should get a full month's worth of jump pay, just like the active duty troops do. Secretary Wormuth, do you commit to completing this review to ensure the service members within the Army Reserve components are paid the same special and incentive pays as their active duty counterparts when they maintain the same critical skills or face the same risk, and what is your timeline for doing so? Thanks, Senator Duckworth. Yes, uh, we are working with RAND right now to basically help us develop a framework to be able to assess, you know, as you know very well, there are many different types of special pays and incentives. There's also many different types of duty statuses for guard and reservists. So we've been working with RAND to come up essentially with a framework that is going to be a tool for us to, to be able to determine which special pays and incentives may qualify for the full pay. Um, I will have to take for the record the exact timeline when the RAND work will be completed, but I can assure you we are not trying to slow roll you. All right, I will get back in touch with you in 90 days to get that timeline. Uh, Senator Wormuth, in your opening statement, you communicated that you would continue to prioritize the Indo-Pacific. The Indo-Pacific region is also a priority for me, and as the Army continues its modernization efforts, I am ready and available to lend my support to ensure the Army's resource and posture for any future conflicts in the region. In fact, along um, uh, with Senator Sullivan, we'll be leading a CODEL to the Shangri-La dialogues that are coming up in just over a month. Um, the Army will need to operate in a distributed but a connected manner for survivability, placing greater demands on enablers such as logistics, force protection, and command and control. The Army's current backbone of its intra-theater lift in the Indo-Pacific consists of Army watercraft systems like the LSV and the MSV, but I am concerned that the Army is not dedicating enough funding to these platforms in the fiscal year 25 budget, which can only lead to a capacity gap in our intra-theater sea lift. 
Secretary Wormuth, how does the Army plan to fund and continue to modernize the Army watercraft systems over the next few fiscal years? Thanks, Senator. Uh, as you noted, first of all, we have a composite watercraft company in Japan. I'm actually going to get to see that in July myself. Uh, we have money in the budget for the MSV light version uh, that I think will begin fielding, if I'm not mistaken, in FY28. We also have a requirement for a heavy version of that. And uh, as the chief alluded to earlier, we are exploring with Army Materiel Command what we can do in terms of uh, offshore supply via, um, vessels, things that the commercial sector is using that may be more cost effective for us. Because we do see the requirement for contested logistics as substantial, but as is the case with many things, our challenge is having enough resources to be able to do that, but then also invest in air and mid uh, missile defenses and other things that we need. But that's broadly the outlines of our plan. I'm all for buying off the shelf if it's cheaper and it can work and it still keep our troops safe and, and accomplish the mission. General George, I'm going to uh, pass it over to you. Can, you. can you describe the Army's current capabilities for intra-theater sea lift in the New Pacific? And how is the Army working with other services um, and combatant commands like TRANSCOM to develop a unified intra-theater sea lift strategy for the Indo-Pacific? I think you, um, Senator, kind of summed it up at the end there. These Anytime we're going to do any, anything out there, it's going to be a joint mission. We're going to have to work with everybody. Just And I know the Secretary got to see our, the J-LOTS when it went in um, for Talisman Sabre down in, in Australia. So we are looking at, at all the different aircraft or the watercraft, and we're looking at how the oil industry, for example, sends stuff. They do a lot of unmanned systems um, and leasing. I also think it, this gets after also what are we doing to 3D print it's the whole contested logistics. How are we doing telemaintenance? What do we have for pre-position stock where we're doing it? And then the other thing I just wanted to highlight that you you kind of set up front as far as being distributed, um, a big part of that too is is making sure on our network that we're also low signature. All you know, this is important for all of us, and that will tie all of that um, together. And our contested contested logistics. CFT and would love to have them come up and brief you um, on what they're doing in advancing all of these areas was stood up last fall and they're getting after all of this. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, just one quick thing. Um, I'd like to submit for the record a, a question for uh, on aeromedical evacuation in the Indo-Pacific. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Dockworth. Uh, Senator Schmidt, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General George, I do want to give you a shout out here. Um, I think that um, uh, looking for those new and innovative ways to uh, to recruit is sometimes a challenge, but always welcome. And I saw uh, recently um, that the Army's entered into a, a partnership with the UFL, which is the new spring football league. I'm a little biased here. The St. Louis Battle Hawks have the highest, by far and away, highest attendance numbers. They average 35,000 people at these games. And so I think that's... Um, uh, a smart way to reach a new audience. I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities there. Can you walk me through how this kind of came to be and what you expect from it? Sure, um, Senator. The uh, and I agree with you. We do think it will be a good audience. Um, people love watching football. I'm at top of that list. Um, the part of this with the UFL that I like about um, the comparisons are these are a bunch of last year. I think there was a hundred that came out of the UFL that went into the pros. I mean, what we need to get out to everybody, it's the same thing in the Army. You can come into the Army and you can accelerate your life. You're going to advance your life. And so um, uh, they were interested in this partnership with us, and we studied it with our marketing um, agency, and we're in a one-year you know, agreement to see how this works. But so far, it's been really good, and we've had troopers telling their stories at, at every one of these games across all compos. So I'm, I'm sure we've had soldiers out there on the sideline doing that, which I think is great. That's good. Yeah, maybe we'll, um, we'll have to follow up and get you the, uh, a T-shirt that call is the law, which is the <laughs> call is for the Battle Hawks. Anyway, all right. So, um, Secretary Warmouth, I do want to ask you a question. Um, um, you know, I enjoyed our, our visit at Fort Leonard Wood. I guess I was around a year ago. It was in August, maybe. Um, as you know, in last year's NDAA, um, it required certain criteria and certifications be made by you before the Army can relocate um, the Army's CID Special Agent Training Course or any of its training cadre. Despite that, our office has learned recently 
that the Army, Army is already in the midst of a comprehensive overhaul of CID training and, and composition. And maybe most concerning, the Army Times reported that, quote, in the Army, the lowest retention job specialties for men were criminal uh, investigation, investigation division special agent with a retention rate of 38% for fiscal year 23. We also learned that CID agents are already flowing through pipelines in the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center, the Fleet C. So this was one of the things that we were trying to address in the NDAA. And it feels like, and I'd like for you to maybe give some explanation, it feels like this is an effort to get around the law because um, there's supposed to be a process before what appears to be happening is actually happening. So I wanted to give you an opportunity to walk me through this because it feels like a workaround. Certainly, Senator Schmidt. Uh, we, we do not want to try to do a workaround. Uh, you know, I think, as you know very, very well, we are in the process of transforming the Criminal Investigative Division, and it is our intent to have 60% of those agents uh, become civilian. That's, that's a big change, and I think uh, I'm not intimately familiar with the retention statistics for CID, but I think part of what you're seeing a little bit is change is hard. I'm certainly aware, you know, I know that there is some anxiety um, from our uniformed folks about the transformation, uh, but we want to comply with the law, and what I'd like to do is make sure that we have Director Ford come and brief you on how he is proceeding, uh, you know, certainly we continue to plan to have our uh, MPs and agents train at Fort Leonard Wood. Uh, there, there is also, I think, some training they're doing with FLETC, but what I'd like to do is have Director Ford come and talk with you in detail about what they're doing. Okay, let's do that, because uh, that's a, a very important role that Fort Leonard Wood plays. And um, I think one of the reasons why we wanted to to make sure before there's any real change that it's a it's a real process, and it appears as though maybe um, some some things are moved being moved away, um, whether it's without those certifications or not. So we'll work with you on that. And look forward to that briefing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Schmidt. Uh, I've been informed that Senator Rosen also would like to return and ask her question. So let me take this opportunity to. Uh, uh, continue the theme of congested logistics. Uh, critical to, to that is in, in fuel efficiency of every moving uh, platform uh, together with uh, improved maintenance. Uh, General George, can you comment on the progress you're making and the plans you have in that regard? And then I'll ask Senator Wormuth. Um, yeah, Chairman, I think uh, hybridization is is important to us. One, for the um, reduce our logistical tail um, for our formations. So I think we're looking at hybridization for all of our vehicles um, that are out there, specifically any of our newer platforms. Um, we are, the, the other big advantage that you get with this is that you also get silent watch and silent approach. So they all, also these vehicles um, are gonna be more lethal on the battlefield. So, I mean, that's really what we're looking at. Um, in total um, with some of this effort. We are looking at, there may be some sensors out there that may be, elect, you know, that would be st strictly electric because then we could do the same thing mm -hmm. on the ground, get them out there, um, silent approach and put them out there. Um, but I think all of those things combined are gonna make us more lethal and um, more mobile um, on the battlefield and lower signature. Uh, thank you. And your comments, Ms. Madam Secretary. Chairman, the only thing I would add is uh, two things maybe. One, I think an additional benefit of some of the hybrid vehicles that we're looking at is that in addition to fuel efficiency, silent watch, uh, they offer in some cases the ability to power other devices that we have so we can actually hook you know, other systems that we have up to those batteries. Uh, and then the second thing I would note is just, you know, this is an area where the commercial sector has done a lot of work. And so we're trying to partner with companies in the commercial sector to leverage all of the investment they've already made to see how it can benefit us in the Army. And one topic that's uh, come up uh, in your conversation and discussions is the uh, notion of uh, maintenance in the field, uh, employing 3D printing, uh, and also having the intellectual property to, to do that to do that effectively. Uh, is that a specific goal and program you have in place, Madam Secretary? 
We're certainly uh, looking at everything we can do with 3D printing in terms of helping us with contested logistics, helping us get you know parts much closer to the tactical edge, if you will. And we're looking at you know what we can do with that. Uh, you know, obviously, one of the issues there with 3D printing is making sure that the components that are being fabricated meet our safety standards. So there's some work that we have to do there. Uh, I, I think another thing that we're doing is telemaintenance. You know, that's something we've seen be very, very effective in Ukraine. And so thinking about how we can apply telemaintenance for ourselves. Mm -hmm. The other thing I would add, uh, again, that we've also seen with the Ukrainians is the importance of predictive analytics when it comes to logistics. So we are now doing much more to be able to see where everything we need is and to be able to anticipate what future requirements may be. Uh, can General George, you have any comments? Sure, I'll add on the, on the 3D printing. Um, the other thing that we can look at, I think, for the future is UAS is something else that we're looking at. So whether or not you're producing kind of the bus or the body part of an unmanned system, whether it was ground or air, or that you could also replace it. So much like the secretary said, we're I think we're trying to look at this at scale too. Um, out in Rock Island, there's one of the largest you know additive manufacturing capabilities um, that we have in the army. So you know we when we struggle with long lead time parts, I think that that's definitely something that could fill that in. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you very much. I just want to add a comment. I was out at Fort Sill uh, on Friday and was at the university. Uh, designed to uh, develop tactics against drones, and uh, I was impressed, but I think we have a long, long way to go uh, in terms of uh, the uh, devices to engage them and also uh, just the, the tactics, too. But uh, I will commend both of you for establishing uh, that facility. We're thinking ahead rather than reacting to something that uh, is facing us. So uh, my commendation to both. Uh, Senator Rosen. Oh, thank you, Chairman Reed. I really appreciate you uh, holding it open for me. And uh, I'd also like to thank Secretary Warmoff and General George uh, for testifying today and for following through, following through on your commitments to me to build Nevada's first certified small arms training range so that Nevada National Guard will no longer have to travel out of state to fulfill their annual weapons qualification. And it's at an average cost of half a million dollars per unit, $500,000, so it's saving money too. And the inclusion of the range in the President's budget request is greatly appreciated because this range is gonna improve the readiness of the National Guard their ability to answer the nation's call at a greater convenience and, like I said, lower cost to the taxpayer. And so we have cyber workforce development issues. So in the FY24 NDAA, uh, it included my bipartisan legislation authorizing the Army to create a civilian cybersecurity reserve to provide Cybercom with qualified civilian personnel to serve in reserve capacities to support operations in cyberspace. So Secretary Warmoth, Warmoth is, um, what's the status of the implementation plan for the civilian cyber reserve? Thanks, Senator Rosen, uh, and we're very pleased that we were able to get that range in the budget. Um, on the civilian cyber corps, you know, we we absolutely want to make sure we we are taking as much advantage as we can of all of the available cyber expertise. I, I think what we've been in discussions with with um, U.S. Cybercom is to think of, is to work with them. First of all, NSA does the badging and the credentialing mm -hmm. that would be required for those civilians, so we don't control that. Okay. Uh, but I think what we can do is talk to Cybercom about. What are their requirements? We can look at our requirements and see if there's a way to structure a pilot to think about exactly where would we need to have civilians fill in and sort of how to do that. But I think we're, we're a service that would like to, to have a pilot to look at what can be done. As a former computer programmer, I would have, uh, now I'm, I'm doing this, but in my young, younger days and in my, uh, even as I got into my uh, 40s or 50s, I would have liked to have been able to serve at this point to do what I did as a programmer, so I think it's important to have that. But I want to move on, uh, Secretary, with uh, the impact of the EPA ruling on Hawthorne Army Depot. And so Hawthorne Army Depot, it's in northern Nevada, 
and we demilitarize one third of the Department of Defense obsolete munitions via open burn and detonation. As you're aware, the Environmental Protection Agency recently proposed a new rule to revise regulations that allow for open burning and detonation of certain explosives like munition and propellants. The rule does not consider the national security implications for DOD facilities or the lack of available technology for large-scale disposal, and this could have serious impacts on Hawthorne. And so the rule is now open for public comment after going through interagency review process. And from conversations that my office has had with your staff and with Hawthorne, I know the Army has serious concerns with the impact of this rule um, on your ability to fulfill DOD's munitions demilitarization requirements should it take effect. And so um, maybe you could speak to us about what would happen if the implementation is written or as the way they want to do it now, what challenges would this rule create for facilities like Hawthorne to be able to accomplish the critical mission we have of ensuring the readiness of the munitions stockpile and also the impact on the workforce at Hawthorne? Thank you, Senator. And I'm, I'm broadly aware of the, of the EPA <laughs> rule that's out there right now for comment right now, and I would agree with you. I think it could have significant implications for Hawthorne. Actually, uh, the chief and I were over on the House side earlier this week, and one of your colleagues in the delegation raised it. Uh, you know, we, we need to be able to dispose of the munitions that are there that are being stored at Hawthorne. Uh, there's a lot of important work that's done there. And in some cases in the past, we've been able to find alternative technologies uh, that we can use. To there isn't alternative technologies for most of it yet. So Yes, so that's one of the concerns that we have. Uh, so what I'd like to do is, you know, do some consultations <coughs> with Army Materiel Command and, and look in more detail at what this might mean for Hawthorne and then proceed from there. But it, certainly we need to have that that munitions disposal capability. I think we need to uh, be working uh, with the EPA because once they finalize this rule, it's gonna be much more difficult. So I'm gonna have my office contact you to see how we engage in this process while they're doing this before they make a determination and we have to find some other way around it um, that's gonna have an impact on this important mission. Certainly. Um, Thank you. I see that my time is up, and I see Senator Sullivan is here, so uh, thank you. Thank you, Senator Rosen. And Senator Sullivan, if you could uh, stay within the five-minute mark, because we want to go and start a closed session. Mr. Chairman, I, I always stay within the five-minute mark. <laughs> <laughs> Your imagination is yeah. profound. <laughs> okay. Just, uh, that's a little inside joke here with me and the chair. Um, well, Madam Secretary, thank you, General. Uh, good to see you guys again. I'd like to get a, um, an update on the Army's formalizing the 11th Airborne MTO. I know that you uh, have been both really big supporters. Uh, I think it's great. We got another uh, Airborne Division, right? Probably the best in the Army right now. No offense to the 82nd Airborne Division, Mr. Chairman, but the 11th Airborne Division in Alaska is, is gaining quickly on the 82nd. It's, just, it's always good to have inner service or inner army competition. But um, I'm hoping that the MTO will alleviates the self-funding bur burden that the division has shouldered since it stood up a few years ago. As you know, uh, some of the ops, some of the training, some of the elements of um, uh, operating in the cold weather in Alaska cost more in, I think, we want to make sure that that unit is getting resourced in a very realistic way so they're not having to kind of undertake this self-funding burden on them. So can you give me, either of you, an update on that? Sure, why don't I start and then turn it over to the chief, who I know is very focused on this. Um, one thing we're doing, first of all, I would note uh, to your comments about the Airborne, uh, as you probably know, elements of the 11th Airborne did a, an Airborne drop over Norway, I think, just in February or March oh, that was great. very successful. And but, there was some very serious cold weather training. It was done yeah, all in winter. Yeah, in February, exactly. Yeah, 40 below. I mean, people were getting on. It's not easy to operate in 40 below zero. Yeah, I can only imagine, literally, as someone who grew up in Texas. But we are doing two war games this year uh, specifically to help us better understand kind of what are the needs of the soldiers 
in terms of their cold weather gear, cold weather equipment. So that's one initiative we have underway to help us uh, look at the MTO, but let me let the chief build on that. Um, so having been up in uh, Alaska in February, March, I mean, surviving is, is tough. And so we're really proud of the 11th Airborne, the big exercise that the secretary was talking about. I mean, not only surviving, but thriving. Yeah. Um, and so there, we've increased our training. You know, we have the joint um, multi-purpose training up there that you can do almost anything in Alaska, and that's a real advantage to us. And so um, India, for example, was also out as our partners and, and trained up in Alaska. We're doing an MTO review right now. As you know, Senator, what works um, in Texas um, for systems doesn't necessarily work or won't work when it's 40 or 50 below up in Alaska. So, um, and the vice is going to under, and I think you've met with him recently, yeah. is going to go through exactly what we want to do is, is make sure that they have the right equipment for operating in the Arctic. Yeah. And then how do we kind of put set some aside because the other great thing about that unit, they're very physically hard. They can operate yeah. anywhere in right. the world. And we have that capability to do that. Well, we, I, I, General, I appreciate you directly addressing this because, as you know, when you're looking at the difference in operational capability, no matter what it is, it's harder and more expensive to operate in that kind of environment. And sometimes in the past, I was worried that that was just got ferry dusted. Well, well, you're going to get the same amount of money as the units down in the lower 48. Don't worry about it being tougher in the Arctic, but it is tougher. You guys are seeing it, so I think they need to be resourced in that in that way to, that addresses that. W would you agree? I would agree, and what we're trying to do as well, like for resourcing, make sure that they're also not taking care of equipment that doesn't going to work. Yeah. So we're going to pull some of that out. So I think it's a combination of things to make sure that we've given them the cold weather equipment. I think we're trying, what we got to do now is make sure we have it, it's sustainable, that we can give it to them. We're buying additional cat Vs. As you know, that's what you need to be <coughs> operational that's up there. We're reviewing all of that. Great. Let me uh, turn to the topic the three of us discussed in my office a couple months ago on the Army force structure changes. Some big articles in Alaska. Some people actually had some concerns about kind of the overall kind of top line numbers. You know, we went through that whole 425 issue where the Obama administration was going to get rid of the 425, and that was actually us here in the Congress who stopped that. But in our meeting, uh, you two both uh, mentioned to me that the force structure changes that the Army's doing overall are going to mean a increase of 1,469 more soldiers in Alaska by 2030. Can I just, in this committee, kind of in the hearing room, can I just get, get your recommitment to that number? Senator, I will say I don't have the number off the top of my head, but we do have those numbers, and I'm certainly willing to you know, I, I am confident that what we explained to you before was accurate, so yeah. we commit to that. Okay. And I just was going to add, Senator, I think part of it was, too, was uh, we have the force structure up in Alaska. We need to recruit now, which we're in, we're doing better yeah. um, to fill out those formations, which is what we really are trying to get after immediately. Great. I had several more questions, but being um, uh, uh True to my word to the chairman, I'm going to yield my time back. Uh, Senator, we welcome you to join us in a closed session. Oh, good. And okay. you may thank ask you, those Mr. questions chair. there. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Senator Sullivan. And thank you, Madam Secretary and General George. Uh, we will close uh, the open session and reconvene in SVC 217 at approximately 1130. Uh, thank you very much. With that, I will deem the open session closed.